Hi, everybody. It's Gustavo, the host of the Enable Disabled podcast. It is my great pleasure to have Aaron Bush with us today. Aaron is a licensed travel agent through Guide Me Away. He has a lot of experience for helping travelers make sure that their experience is as easy and problem-free as possible. Aaron has some mobility challenges himself, and he is an expert at helping people make sure that their travel experience is as seamless as possible. Aaron is also an actor and he plays uh, power soccer. So we're going to have a really interesting conversation with him and we have a lot to learn. A brief description of myself. I am a middle-aged Latin American male. My hair is dark brown and it's combed <laughs> in the, it's parted in the middle. And um, I'm wearing a black polo shirt and I am in my living room with some blinds and beige drapes behind me. Aaron, welcome to the show. Can you give us a brief description of yourself, please? Oh boy, what to, where to start? That Some of the things that you haven't covered. I Yes, I am a certified travel agent. It is tech, the technical term that I use is a certified accessible travel advocate. So it's basically a travel agent that assists travelers with disabilities. And my area of expertise that I perform very well on is how to fly without having your wheelchair broken, which is something that, that I've done quite a bit. And yes, I am, I too, my hair is brown, combed over, and I have a white wall behind me. Awesome. And you're wearing a white shirt and you've got some cool looking white headphones on. Yes. I have a white shirt and my button is not done up, but so, better. Yeah, awesome. So let's get started. Obviously, I have a lot of travel questions, but before we dive into that, I'm curious about your acting background and how you got into that. So I've pretty much been pursuing acting since I was uh, in my teen, uh, my teenage years, I started in on Vancouver Island. I went to Spotlight Academy. Uh, some of the big name, one of the big names that you might recognize out of that agency is Adrian Huff, who uh, I most recently saw on the Sabrina, and uh, Cameron Bright. I haven't seen him in a while, but I met him a couple times in person, and uh, and he. Yeah, he went to, he came out of Spotlight Academy as well. And then I went to Red Room Studio where Andrew McElroy has taught or teached, taught my grammar. And then it was a while before I started going, I pursued, pursued voiceover for a while and did a whole bunch of stuff on YouTube. And then went, got back into the principal side of acting and graduated from Vancouver Film School with a diploma, went to, yeah, graduated from Vancouver Film School with a diploma, went through, uh, got an agent in uh, film and uh, television. What else? That led to... Got you, what got you interested in acting, though, Aaron? What was the initial pull for you to say, this is something I want to do professionally? It was just, I think it was just the funnest thing to do in school. It was, I mean, it's actors tell stories and I like storytelling. I play games that, that are story driven. I don't, I, I'm and everything that I watch or play or read or any, anything along those lines is all interesting if it's story driven. And at one point I'm just like, I want to do this too. So how do I get into this? And that kind of one thing led to another. And now I am a represented actor for film, TV, and auditioning quite frequently. And yeah, that's my fiance is also represented at the same agency. She has a disability as well. And we're just taking it one, to, one step at a time. Do you have a favorite project that you've worked on so far? Probably my YouTube series. I, I did a fan dub at one point for uh, for the Final Fantasy series. It was the Final Fantasy IX fan dub, which has it's not hasn't been official, completely unofficial fan project, but went for a good went for a good ten years with some very dedicated actors that remained on board through most of it, and has like thousands of views. So, awesome. 
I will link to the, we'll make sure to put a link to that on the blog, but I know for a fact that there are people listening to this who are huge Final Fantasy fans and, and love Final Fantasy IX, so I'm sure they're going to want to hear the dub. Yes, I will not I will not go into a debate about which Final Fantasy is the best. I, I think my personal favorite is 10. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to anger people by saying, no, oh, no, 7's the best. No, 9's the best. No, 10's the best. That's very cool. So how... Have you noticed more roles opening up recently with the, at least it seems like there are more actors and actresses with a disability who are getting some more prominent roles and a bit more stories coming out. Are you seeing that, that trend up there too? Who have I seen that's having some, there's uh there was one character on Raising Dion that's, uh, or one actress on Raising Dion, her name was was I don't have her name offhand. Was Sammy Haney? She's she's in a Netflix series. So why is my camera doing this? There we go. Who else? Sparsh Shaw. He's uh, not a actor, but he's a singer uh, slash rapper. I've seen. There's another one from the middle. He's doesn't doesn't use a wheelchair, but he has a lie. Uh, Atticus Schaefer. Okay. Well, are you yourself personally seeing more roles and more opportunities opening up? There's more, there's more in the way of representation. It's better now than it was back in like the early 2000s when you had able-bodied actors playing a lot of disabled roles. And now there's a lot more, a lot more representation for people with disabilities playing roles that are meant for them. Yeah. Very cool. I hope Hopefully that trend continues and hopefully in, in a few, in six months or three months or whatever it is, when you, when you land your major role, you'll, uh, you'll come back on the show and remember us and we can keep talking to you. So what brought you into, obviously you, you use a wheelchair and I know you've had a lot of experience traveling, but what got you into the the travel business as a business, how did that opportunity present itself? I use a wheelchair for longer distances. Like I can walk. If anybody saw a picture of me, they'd probably see that I do have like photos where I'm standing up and, and whatnot. So it's not like you, the term of a wheelchair user doesn't necessarily mean that the person's incapable of standing or walking. It just means that they have functioning mobility, functional mobility problems that limits their general mobility. Just, sorry, repeat the question one more time and I'll go forward with that. Sure. No, what brought you, what got you interested in the travel space and how did that, how did that, how did that opportunity come about and right? What, what got yeah. you interested in? How did the opportunity come about? So I've mostly been, uh, I've mostly been handling travel for other uh, like friends, family, colleagues for quite some time. It wasn't anything that I was doing professionally and it wasn't something that I was doing from any sort of licensed perspective. That was more just a courtesy that that I was I didn't I wasn't in the position where I could call an airline and 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 say, hey, I have a client that's looking to travel to California. Can you, can we look up this client's uh, reservation and make some modifications? I can't exactly do that if I'm, if I'm not working at a travel agency. I can, but it's not legal. Eventually, as I grew more accustomed to booking, ha ha booking packages or helping people with their vacation packages, I started realizing that I could probably get help more people if I was in a position where I'm where I am licensed to do this because people are spending money on this. They're not going to want to spend money if it's if the person doesn't have any credentials to validate their experience. And then it wasn't until I went into the uh, conference uh, Osteogenesis Imperfective Foundation conference in 2016. 2018 that that I started seeing a lot of other people with power wheelchairs that had significantly arrived with like significant damage from their trip over and, and from their flight over and I'm just like maybe I should get 
uh, into this a little more professionally so that I can be a better advocate for people that are making these just rewinding there some of these people that had flown in they like like I'd, I'd ask them did you I see you sustained damage to your wheelchair did you report it and they were like no it never nothing ever good comes with that anyway so i mean it was put me in this position people are sustaining damage to their wheelchairs they're these airlines are like they're I know why it's happening. I know why a person's getting uh, have has is getting into these positions where they're having wheelchair damage and whatnot. And it there's things that they can do to make that to to help with that. And either they're not acting on it before they travel, or they aren't acting on it after they travel. And it has repercussions if they they don't act on it and if if i break my wheelchair i can just i can it's limiting but it's not the end of the world whereas a person with muscular dystrophy or cerebral palsy or total paralysis if they break their wheelchair it's they're they're going to be in bed for or with a rental for who knows how long so it's it's those situations that that i'm in this mindset where I know how to help these people and I wanted to pursue an endeavor where I could get certified to do, uh, to do that, people can come to me and trust that I know what I'm talking about. It's a huge, it's a huge problem. There's been some pretty prominent cases in the last, I think, uh, couple of years of one person who passed away because her wheelchair was damaged and the, I guess the spare wheelchair or the replacement wheelchair that they gave her did not ended up injuring her body and she unfortunately passed away. So it's a huge problem. I'm glad that you stepped up and are using your experience to help people, but let's talk about the why. So why is this happening as frequently as it's happening and what for let's start there and then we'll get into some of the things that you advise people to do to minimize the the probabilities of something like that happening yeah when i was putting together a petition package for the for my us green card i was doing a lot of research on the just how many cases there are on a day on a yearly basis for wheelchair travelers and some of the names that came up weren't just uh, like you were saying in gracia figueroa who uh, passed away nick cole john morris tim rose valentin duthion lucy duthion maria mcclellan Lauren Barwick, Theo Donnelly, Brees Gilles, Tammy Duckworth, who's the senator of Illinois, Shane Burcock, Corey Lee, Gabriel DeFiver, Matthew Weatherby. These are just a few of the names that 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 have come up like in the last two, three years. And it's something that happens about uh, when you look at the statistics, it's something that's happening about 29 times per day on average. So why it's happening is quite simple. Larger umbrella is that the airlines are damaging wheelchairs. Now there's things that are there. There's things that are going on when that contribute to that. But the general the general uh, consensus is that uh, a person arrives at an airport, they either haven't planned their itinerary as well as they could have, or they haven't communicated the, they haven't communicated the statistics, they, they haven't communicated how to handle their wheelchair properly, or they haven't communicated with the airline properly, or they have, and, and it was just the airline they got the wrong person at the airline and and they're arriving at their destination with a with a broken wheelchair so that's the that is the overall arc of it now that i haven't gone into more specifics yet but that's the over that, that's a short that's a short version of it okay so it's partially obviously with these with airlines they're putting on as many flights as they can per day so there's going to be some people who 
maybe they have a, they're in a time rush or they're careless or they're treating the wheelchair, a piece of luggage instead of a critical mobility device, which it is right. There's all these, there's all these factors that go into play, but if you're going into the airport, let's start there. So you're a traveler, you're going into the airport, you're using your wheelchair user. What is it that, what's the first thing that you do? Assuming they haven't booked through you, what's the first thing that there's that they should do when they get there? Take us through the steps of what the best plan of attack is once they're at the airport. The the plan of attack would start before you get to the airport, but do you just want me to start at the airport at this point or let's start, let's say Aaron, that they haven't booked through a travel agency, they haven't worked with you. When, yeah, let's start there. So when they're booking their flight, what's the, what's from there? What's, what are the steps? Take us through the steps of what they should be doing. The first thing you need to do is you need to, you need to make sure the, you need to look at the airplane that you're going to be on. There's a difference between flying on, uh, on a Boeing, uh, 737 or a seven or a max and an Embraer or at worst, a regional jet. A lot of the smaller airports use regional jets to to fly into larger airports, and those are not going to be large enough to accommodate a wheelchair. They're, the height of those uh, cargo doors are about 32 inches. And if you take a measuring tape and take the headrest off your wheelchair, it odds are it's going to be about 36, maybe 37 inches minimum. So the first thing, yeah, is making sure the you're not on one of those smaller aircrafts because that'll be your first major problem second is are they communicating with the airline if you've booked through a company like expedia uh, orbits or even some of these credit card companies that offer travel uh, travel rewards for points their agents don't tend to ask the questions that a recognized medical recognized agent with a disability perspective would understand so they're not going to ask you what are the dimensions of your wheelchair what are the what type of battery does it use they're going to they might book a service request you tell them you're in a wheelchair they might book a service request into into the file or they might just make a remark which nobody will see because they have to go into the file to see that to see that you're using a wheelchair that's that's generally the first problem. Can I just interrupt you real quick? Yeah. What happened? What is, how is it different if you're booking directly through an airline? If you're booking directly through an airline, again, it depends if you're booked, it, it depends on the agent. The If you're booking through central reservations, you might get an agent that's fairly familiar with the, with booking a for a disability. You might get an agent who's might be their first day on the job. And there's just so many people working at through central reservations because we're in a pandemic and everybody wants to travel right now. So air airlines are hiring and the there so, so you if you, so maybe I call into American Airlines. I get an agent who's fairly familiar they're going to ask me, what are the dimensions of my wheelchair? What type of battery or am I using? Do I have a serviced animal? Do I have anything else that I need to put on the file? And that'll, it is not normally central reservations that needs to answer these questions. It's the medical desk. Most airlines have a medical desk. American Airlines has one. Delta Airlines has one. United has it. Air Canada has it. They all, these, these departments are specifically trained to accommodate passengers with disabilities and when you when you so, so that's these are the people that you need to talk to when you're booking your itinerary and sometimes the reason you give them the dimensions is because if they're if the aircraft is too small they're supposed to tell you that the size of your wheelchair uh, is too big for that particular aircraft, and then they'll have to rebook you. That is also hit or miss because not every agent will answer that question. The other thing is that most of these airlines or most of these airplanes are meant to book travelers with disabilities into the bulkhead section. If you use a wheelchair, you can request 
the Balkan seating. I know American Airlines has specific requirements that you have to have a fused leg to sit in that section. But companies like United and Delta and Alaska uh, tend to be a little more accommodating with, with the general seating location. So is the, is the medical desk for these airlines something that when you're calling an airline directly, you should ask to speak to the medical desk? Or is it something that the person taking the reservation is supposed to communicate with the medical desk. How does that, what's the proper, what's the best procedure? So some, they're, they're different. Some airlines will let you, will ask that you book through central reservations first and then make the medical, medical justifications, make your medical justifications through the medical desk. The, I guess the issue with that is that if you're booking through central reservations and the agent you get doesn't understand the perspective or you don't understand the perspective. Like I have clients right now that, that are, that, that are looking to travel and they didn't know that uh, regional jets are too small for, to accommodate a wheelchair. I had to educate them on the process that general where generally accidents happen. And those accidents, a lot of those accidents happen in the pre-departure, in the pre-planning process. And a lot of those accidents happen after arrival and departure at the airport. Yeah. Without, without giving, because I think this is interesting to highlight, when somebody hires you to book their trip for them and to plan the details of it, what do you, I don't want to, if there's any special proprietary thing that you don't want to share, that's fine. But generally speaking, or as much as you can share what do you do to make sure that the airline does its job in this pre-planning phase? So when somebody calls me and says, hey, I'm looking to travel to Seattle, what I mean, there's questions I ask is uh, the, what I need to know is what are the dimensions of your chair? What type of battery are you using? Because these are questions the airlines can ask me. What are your travel dates? Are your travel dates flexible? Are you looking to travel economy, first class business. And then the more important question is, is have you traveled before? Because if they have never traveled before, then there's going to be some education involved in the differences of somebody who's able-bodied who's traveling and somebody who's traveling with a wheelchair. And the client needs to know the, the likely the likely repercussions that are that will take place if they travel without if they travel without the awareness of these situations okay so then pivoting back here so you're you've asked you when you're booking with the airlines you're asking the questions needed for the dimensions of the chair you have any service uh, animals and the battery once you do that and all that's taken care of appropriately, what do you do when you get to the airport? Or what do you do? Is there anything else that people need to be aware of or plan for before they're traveling, before the, the day that they're going to the airport? I think the most important part of in the planning process is making sure the air, uh, airplane, you're on the right size airplane. That's likely the most, that, that's one of the most that's one of the biggest things to cover, and uh, I'm sure there's one or two things I'm missing, but it, it's been a long day. Yeah, making sure the airplane is the connections, yes, making sure that you have more than an hour at your at your if you're taking more than uh, if your flight yeah, if your flight is not direct, then you need more than an hour at your at the airport that you're uh, flying into. Because you may be the first person on the plane, but you're not going to be the first person off the plane. You're probably going to be the last person off the plane. And that's that could take anywhere between 20 minutes to 45 minutes because they need to unload everybody from the plane and the ground crew needs to grab your wheelchair off the from underneath, bring it up, bring you, uh, or they're going to take it to the next plane if you're in a hurry. And they're going to, you'll have to tell the flight crew, hey, I'm in a hurry. I got to catch my connection. And then you're going to have to, they'll, if you're flying with the same airline, they'll, they may take it to the next airplane. If you're flying with a different airline, then there's going to be a long process to uh, get to your connecting flight. 
And this is why you need more than an hour to, to when transferring. The second thing is how many connections you're on. If you're on one, if you're on a direct flight, then the likelihood that you'll arrive at your final destination is with damages is quite minimal. If you're on one connecting flight, that leaves two opportunities for the airline to uh, mishandle something. One at your connecting airport and one at your final destination. If you're on two connecting flights, that gives three opportunities. One at your first arrival airport, another at your second arrival airport, and a third at your final destination. Typically, you want to avoid having having a flight that with two connections, if at all possible. And when you so when you arrive at the airport and you're checking in is there is there do they check in your chair before you go through security do they do it after you go through security what's the process there you tend to get to the checking counter and they'll they'll take information about your chair they should already have it on file if you've done your job or if the travel agent has done their job or if the airline has done their job. If they don't have the information there, then that could be a problem because you may be in a situation where you can't travel because the airline doesn't have, excuse me, the airline doesn't have the information on file. If everybody, if everything's been relayed properly, then there's no problem. The only problem at the checking counter might be that, that like I said, there, there may be something missing or there's, or, or they've, determined that your chair might be too big for the aircraft. If that's the case, then you may get rebooked. If everything's good, then uh, they'll check in your chair. They will, if, they, if, if there's information missing, they'll likely put it into the system and then they'll send you through the security. They'll tag your chair and, sorry, the check-in counter will t tag your chair and they'll send you in th through security. Security, you have uh, two options. One, go through the general lineup. I've had one situation at one airport where they asked me to stand up out of my wheelchair and walk through the walk through the sensor. It doesn't happen often. I can do that, but they shouldn't. That's 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 one of the more ridiculous ob oblivious. That's more the oblivious, the more oblivious security agent that uh, doesn't understand that not every disabled traveler can stand up and walk through the through the sensor gate. So the other option is a private screening. So you can either go off to the side, or they'll take you into a private room where they can where they will pat you down. And uh, you can either have a male patter or a female patter, and then they'll take stuff out of your bag they'll they'll ask you to take anything off your chair that's removable put it through the put it through the scanner and then they'll give it back then from there you go through customs if you are traveling internationally if you're going domestic you don't have to go through customs that's just basic information make sure that the place you're traveling to doesn't require negative covid tests otherwise you're you may not be able to travel. Then from there, you're in the secure area of the airport. From there, you're if let's assume you're going straight to your flight, you're at the gate. There's the you're you got to arrive with plenty of time at the gate. If you're arriving last minute, then that that creates problems. You arrive at the gate. The best thing to do there is to advise I. Uh, Traveling with my power wheelchair is a sensitive piece of equipment. I need to speak with the uh, ramp lead from uh, from down below. You have that right because because there somebody's going to be taking it and they need to know how to handle it. If they don't know how to handle it, then that's that's where problems are going to occur. So. The best way to do is not to just grab anybody from down below. You want to ask for the, the ramp lead is the person that's uh, in charge of, of all the luggage handlers down below. And and if somebody screws up, then, then at least it's his butt on the line. So the ramp lead comes up. He's going to, you're going to, Explain to him, this is how you turn on the chair. This is how you turn off the chair. These are what these buttons do. This moves the you, it, you need to explain it like to somebody who is very computer illiterate. Imagine somebody, you're teaching Windows 10 to somebody who's never used a computer before. I'm literally dead serious. You Like if I was teaching somebody to, how to use a computer, I would have to show them where the start button is because it's to us. 
to, to me, I know where the start button is. It's in the bottom left corner of my computer. But to somebody who's never used a computer, they're going to say, where's the start button? So imagine that, what to do if they want to tilt the chair, If because some people are just going to grab the back and pull the chair to tilt the chair. They may not know that there's a button to do that, because there there is there is areas where there's clearance needed to, to, to get the uh, chair onto the aircraft. There's going to be... You need to explain where the release is to put the chair into manual, because if they need to move the chair without actually turning it on, then you need there's a there's a switch need, down. Yeah. yeah, you need the freedom to move it manually so that you're not right. It's easier for them to manage it where they need to manage it inside the cargo hold. Yeah, yeah, and there there's a lot of different things where where clearance may be needed to get the chair into the cargo. And that could involve reclining the back, taking the back rest off if it's easily detachable, tilting the chair, or reclining the chair, and making sure that they're not tipping the chair on its side or, or, or all these dangerous things that cause damage. Because there are airlines that will remove parts, components of the chair and tip it on its side and in any which direction to get it onto the plane. And these are the main reasons that where a wheelchair damage comes into play. Maybe I'm going, maybe I'm going too far, but have you heard of travelers who say your request to speak to the crew chief or the lead, the, the ramp lead, like you say, should you record that on your phone? Should, or do you, is that maybe going too far? You're clearly explaining to the person what they should be doing, how to handle the chair, and then just leave it at that. It's not necessary because if the if the airline damages the wheelchair while it's in their possession, then they're legally responsible for uh, repairing it. As long as it's reported at the final at your final destination. If you leave the airport and then try and and put in a report about it after, then that's where the airline can come back and say, well, "That's not our." Uh, that's not our fault. So you have to do that when you're arriving at the at your final destination. If you're at a connecting airport, if you're let's say you're flying American to your connecting airport and then uh, United to your final destinations, if you are at a connecting airport, that's where things get a little gray. That's why you need more time at your connecting airport as well, is because if you if the if damage has occurred, then it needs you'll need to report that at your connecting airport and then if you've if damage has occurred with the second airline that would be, that would be reported at your final destination do you always have do you always have the right to say on a, you're on a connecting flight so you're traveling american uh, you get off american and then you're going on to a united flight do you have the right to inspect your chair in that Midpoint, are they supposed to bring you your chair and then you take your chair to the connecting flight? You can always, if you have the time, you can always ask. The, if, they, if you're flying two different airlines, then yeah, you, they're going to bring your chair up to the uh, jet bridge. Okay. If you're flying with the same airline, then all the way through, then you have the right to either request your wheelchair or say, bring it to the next aircraft. It's generally better to, if you're concerned that something if if you're sure that your chair is in good operating condition it's generally better to get a get a professional service center to inspect your chair before you before you travel even if it's a few days out a couple weeks out call your local service center i'm say i'm flying to the, the texas can you can you, i just need somebody to come by i need I need them to assess my, to do a full assessment on my chair. Sometimes this is paid for by insurance. I know here in Vancouver, I can just, I can get the ministry to do a full assessment on the chair once every, once a year, I think. And they can, and then I go, I just call my local service center. I say, hey, I'm I'm flying out in a couple of weeks. I need, I'm wondering, I know that these airlines tend to, damage my wheelchair. I know I have a history with you guys that where this damage has occurred. I just want you to come by, take that, or maybe I can bring my chair in because there's more tools in the shop and I need you guys to do a full inspection of my chair just to 
write it off that everything's in good condition. Then if the airline comes back later and says, and, and says it's not our fault, you've got pe- paperwork that says, I've got a full paperwork here from these guys that are certified in this, this field. And they said this, that, that this was operating in good condition. And now I've arrived here and my chair won't turn on. So that's not my fault. Is there, when you do arrive then at your final destination, it's really important then to be super diligent about inspecting your chair before you leave the airport. Make sure, obviously turning on is the key, but make sure that it's operating smoothly, that you don't, you have to be sensitive to this wheel feels a little out of alignment or it's not responding the way it normally does. Besides like physical damage, you can usually see pretty well, but it's the, I'd imagine it's like the, the more nuanced things that you know from using a chair for that's your chair. Like I know I wear a prosthesis. If there's something off with the prosthetic, I can feel it right away. Yeah. If, if there is a problem at the, when you arrive, there is one point, there's, there is one many years ago when, when I arrived at an airport and the seat felt a little crooked. It didn't, it looked fine, but it didn't feel straight. It just felt a little bit slanted. Like I was leaning just a little bit more to the left than I should have been. And everything else looked looked fine. It was driving fine. It was it was it, it was the seating was fine and everything. And I didn't take a chance. I went to the baggage claim and I said something just feels a little bit off about this. I need to open a, a ticket. And they obliged. They they opened the they started a baggage damage baggage, yeah, damage baggage claim. And they. I got it inspected and it turns out that the that there there's like a main like steel pole underneath that chair that the, that it's like the primary thing that holds the seat up and it turns out they broke that which takes a lot of force it's it, it, it's not like you can just it, it's not like just taking a bottle cap and 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 breaking it it's it would have taken something very severe to to for that to happen like falling off the uh, ramp when it was loading i don't know what happened but if i hadn't reported that it wouldn't have gotten fixed so there's these it, it's definitely yeah if if your chair won't turn on when you arrive at the airport there's it, it may just be the cable at, at the where attached that the joystick plugs into has become disconnected. It may be that there's a, a fuse uh, breaker at the at the back where the battery is that they can that they tend to turn off. They don't need to do that, uh, but they will. And there's I wager there's been times where they've left it on too and the battery is just drained. Yeah, I had a friend that uh, flew w- with me at one one point when we when I went on a cruise. And his chair turned on mid-flight and and drove forward through the entire several hours. And his motors burnt out when uh, when we got to the when we got to our arrival. It didn't drive into anything, but it was on full speed until we got there. And yeah, his motors burnt out when we arrived. But there's things you can do as well because when you fly out, you have the ability to talk to the ground crew when you're at your departing airport but what you don't have what you don't have the ability to do is you don't have the ability to talk to the team that's uh, unloading your wheelchair and that's a, where a lot of problems can occur you can talk to the uh, ground crew at your de- departing airport until you're blue in the face you can de- talk to the ground crew at your connecting airport as well but you can't t- but the air each airport doesn't talk to one another the your airport flying out of seattle won't talk to the airport in Denver. The you'll be able to talk to the if you're connecting in Denver, you can talk to the team in Denver, but they and then you, maybe your final destination is in in Miami, and the, the the team in Denver won't talk to the team in Miami. So the only way you can get the message through to those people is to is what the best practice is to uh, print off a list before you before you fly out. Tape it to your chair and big bold letters. This is what you can do. This is where it's it, take a picture of the thing that detaches your backrest if you need to, and and this is how you 
this is how you handle this. This is where you can lift from. This is what this button does. This is uh, how you move the chair. This is how you turn it on. Try and get as much onto a one page as possible so that, and tape it to the back of your chair so that if, so that when you, when your chair arrives, the people unloading it know how to unload it and what they can and definitely cannot do to, to unload your chair. That's a great idea. And hopefully either, I don't know, through more advocacy, education, training, the airports will start to communicate with each other, or maybe there's another alternative. Maybe we can start building some technology into the chairs where there's a little, a short little 30 second video that you have to watch before you touch it. Something like that. <laughs> it would be handy. Yeah. Air travel right now is like the only uh, only mode of transportation where you can't actually bring a uh, wheelchair on boats, trains, yeah. cruises, buses, cars, vans, everything, r r literally any, everything, anything is wheelchair accessible. But the uh, major mode of transportation to fly from one destination to another, no, they're still treating our wheelchairs like luggage. Yep, that really needs to change. They're, we're really behind the times there. How do you, when you're booking, let's say a hotel, I'm assuming that more hotels now are saying we have uh, accessible rooms and giving some details when you call, but I'm sure there's still a, there's still a lot of them that don't. What kind of advice do you give for people when they're booking a hotel or an Airbnb or someplace to, what do they look for? What should they do to, to help make sure that they'll be accommodated what do you need for your accommodations basically do you need it depends on their disability if they're using a wheelchair do they need they'll likely need an accessible room which should have wider doorways it should have wider hallways the bathroom should be accessible there are rules yes, my question isn't so my question is more like how do you know or find out that the hotel or the place you're staying in has those features if they don't advertise it, basically calling and asking. Yeah, yeah. You call them and ask them, do you have wheelchair accessible rooms? If they say yes, then you need to ask them what accessibility means to them because accessibility might to them could be different than what I'm trying to ask them. Okay. And I know you said, and we've spoken previously, that Disney has, is, basically leading the charge in a lot of ways with the uh, accessible resorts and making making travel and your experience a lot more inclusive that, that's correct like they're pretty much they're pretty much doing a great job of that from what you can see disney is mandated by the americans with disabilities act because they're based in the united states and also, they have, uh, especially in Florida, they have the, there, there is, I, I'm not too familiar with the legal side of the, the business, but be, because I'm more of a travel specialist than a, than a legal specialist, but I do know Florida has some special codes for accommodating people with disabilities. So let, I'm interested in asking you, I think that, is, is there anything that we missed in this segment about traveling and the airlines and hotels that you think is important to talk about that we didn't? We've covered pre-planning. We've covered a pre-departure, post-departure, definitely what you need to do when you arrive at the airport, when you, when you arrive at your connecting airport, when you arrive at your final destination. Those are all the important uh, steps. There, the, these are a lot of things that, that, a lot of, that a lot of people don't tend to ask or that travelers may not may know 80, 90% of, and are just missing that extra 10% to, to accommodate a smooth flight and a, a smooth experience. I def, I've definitely have had travelers, clients that have booked that, that have booked their flights and didn't know that, that there's that, that a regional jet was too small for, for, for travel. Yeah. And it, it just comes to educating, uh, pr providing proper education so that to these travelers, so that, that they're aware uh, that there are much more complex logistics that need to be pre premeditated before you, before they travel. 
No, I think we covered a lot and I think it's really important information to share. Thank you for that. Before we wrap up here, I know that you are an avid power chair football player, and I would love to talk to you about that and learn more about it and how you got into it and what the, what the scene up in Vancouver is like. Yeah. So, uh, I guess we can start with started in, uh, Nanaimo, British Columbia. That was on Vancouver Island. And I was, I mainly played goal. I moved to Vancouver, uh, I think when I was 20. 27. I joined the team in Surrey, moved, eventually moved to Vancouver, started a team in Burnaby, New Westminster, and did a lot of tournaments. I, I, I played, I played in, uh, in yearly tournaments that, that involved a lot of fundraising, a lot of travel. And then it just, it sort of died down a little bit over the years. There's no there's not really, at least to my, at least to my knowledge, there's not really a team. I don't think there's a team in Surrey anymore. There's no more team in North Vancouver. There's no more team in Burnaby. It's def it's definitely not as active as it is in the, in the States. There's 60 some odd teams in the U.S. and BC pro uh, has one, one or two. I did play with the uh, Vancouver team for several years and they and then helped them with with their endeavors for international tournaments and i did play goalie in a lot of those as well so that was that's been my experience playing power soccer oh so it's been you played it super competitive lead what are some of the the first thing is it a recognized uh, paralympic sport i don't think it's gotten to the paralympic stage yet it's it's it definitely in, in, i know canada like the Vancouver team has played in Brazil and where else did they play? There was one more, Japan, I think. Japan and Brazil, I believe. I didn't go to Japan or Brazil, but I but I practiced with them during their practice sessions quite a bit. So what have you learned from playing power chair football? What have been some of the lessons or takeaways that you've gotten from participating in team sports? In what regard? Maybe personally, maybe is it is the main draw for you? Maybe it was a camaraderie with meeting new people. Maybe you just like to compete and see how good you can get at it. Like what's been the benefits for you of participating in team sport? It's just, it was just a fun recreational activity. I, there, I have friends that play power soccer. I have friends here i have friends in california i have i have a lot of respect for the for power soccer and the only reason i dropped out was because at least the rule was in i took a break i didn't drop out but i took a break for a while because i was at one point told that to play in the tournaments i needed to be severely disabled and it was determined that I wasn't disabled enough to play power soccer and because and and that's just because I can uh, I have more mobility and I can turn I, I can turn my head I can turn my body and they said that's not disabled enough to play in these tournaments so you have to go to the lower level and it just I hit a I kind of hit a wall at that point because at least by at least by Vancouver's policies, I wasn't. I wanted to keep playing, but wouldn't let you. Yeah, and then I just at that point, tournaments they slowly started subsiding. At least here, they're still like crazy international and competitive across the U.S. Here, we had these tournaments in a place called Penticton on a every year we'd raise money for that we'd travel and there'd be tons of players that would stay in a hotel over a weekend we we we'd play over two days and and we'd just have fun with it and eventually that that stopped happening and the teams in another we had another one in cloverdale we did that one yearly and i think that one it hasn't happened recently because of the pandemic, but I think prior to the pandemic it was still a yearly a yearly thing. And I'm just like a few blocks away from where the Vancouver team plays when the pandemic isn't in in a state where it's calling off all these recreational events. I'm I'm usually going up there on the weekends to to take part. 
Awesome. That sounds that sounds like fun. I'm going to research that more here in the States and see if we can bring some people on, but hopefully, hopefully they let you play more competitively and participate and open that up. Cause that seems, I, I know Florida has a couple teams. Yeah. I think there's one in Tampa. Okay. Okay. It's, it seems like a very cool sport. I definitely want to, want to research that more. So that's, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So what Aaron, if uh, just to wrap things up, how can people connect to you and reach out to you, book travel with you? I have a Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Aaron Bush, uh, B-U-S-C-H, uh, G-M-A, like golf, Mike alpha. Guidemeaway.com is the website of the uh, travel agency that I'm currently uh, contracted with. I am, my YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com forward slash M1 gaming. And I'm also on twitch.tv forward slash in M-E-S-D-E-N. That's more my gaming channel than my tra- than travel. I do have a blog on the on the uh, Guide Me Away page. So I do write stuff from time to time. I send it to my travel lead and then she posts it on the on, on the travel blog for and and then sends that across social media. So those are some of the those are definitely some of the ways that that they, people can connect with me. I do have I, I generally am working with Canadians right now. Most of my client base is Canada based, but yeah, that's, uh, I have, that... I have a good amount of Canadian listeners. So that all mm-hmm. that helps. And for people who don't know, I, I know what it is because I, I am, I used to play more, but I'm a big uh, video game fan. So what is Twitch TV and what do you, what is it that you're doing on Twitch? I play video games on Twitch. That's uh, just where you take something you like, play a lot of Hearthstone. I play a lot of Final Fantasy games. And and I have this program called Streamlabs. It records the gameplay and broadcasts it to a website called Twitch. And there people can jump in. They can watch what I'm doing. They can talk with me live. And, and, and that's, there, there's a lot of big streamers that, that there, there's some pretty crazy big streamers that, that play a lot of games and they have a lot of a large community and I have a lot of friends that, that stream on Twitch, uh, a lot of friends with disabilities that, uh, stream on Twitch. My, one of my closest friends, uh, and my fiance that we, we both stream on Twitch. My fiance's channel is Amaku173 and my other friend is Redstreak23. So do you play your, so the, the fans and the people who tune into the stream, do you, do you get to play them too in, in games? It depends what I'm playing. So if I'm playing, I used to play World of Warcraft, taking a break from that. But yeah, it's, if, it, if, it's, if I'm playing something that's multiplayer co-op, then sometimes somebody can jump in and, and opt to join along. I used to play Fortnite quite a bit and, and the, one of my friends that I played with quite frequently, we were, we have two or three people in the lobby and then ask somebody from the from their community to join in among us was another one usually gets up to 10 15 people in the lobby so yeah really depends on the point i know earthstone is a com- like a competitive card based strategy yeah. do you have any it's pretty competitive or have you thought about going to any of the tournaments and and competing i'm competitive but i'm not that good at it i got to about well, I play Battlegrounds a lot. I've got to about a 6,000 score on Battlegrounds. Anybody who knows Hearthstone might understand that. I think the pros play somewhere to like a 9,000. Uh, and I've never made it to Legends. So I'm not, I'm good, but I'm not great. Okay. Fair. And it takes a lot of time. Those games are pretty intensive and require some luck and a lot of knowledge and strategy and you're a busy guy. So it's cool that you're doing it though, and sharing your passion with people and building a community. I like that. So Aaron, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for all the very helpful, generous information. And I really appreciate, appreciate you having you on the show. And I look forward to having you back down the road. Thank you.